much for this opportunity. For always and always I have love stories. And in my dad's family, there was a real live storyteller. She was known far and wide for the stories she told. She was my father's mother, my grandmother, Mary Elizabeth Corn Hudson, affectionately known to all as Sugar Corn or Sug. Sug and my grandfather, Ed Hudson, lived in Reserve, New Mexico, 1938, in an adobe house that was wonderfully cool in the summertime and warm in the winter. Grandmother had a large living room with a big feather bed in one corner. And when it got dark, she would sit in a big chair by the fireplace facing the room. Everyone would gather, aunts, uncles, and cousins. They would sit in chairs covered with cowhide that grandfather had made. The only light would be from the fire and the two kerosene lamps on the mantel. Outside, there were horses tied to the gate posts. Their noises made a soft lullaby. I am eight years old and was allowed along with four other cousins on the feather bed where we sprawl out and listen as my grandmother began to talk. Everyone grew quiet. I wallowed deeper into the feather bed and wanting to hear every word. Would it be a story about her grandparents, John R. and Elizabeth Corn's move from North Carolina to Kerrville, Texas? Or the story of the six-wagon caravan that migrated from Kerrville with every intention of making it to Mesa, Arizona? Tonight, Chug told us the story of how Belle Hudson met Billy the Kid. It was a part of family lore. In the spring of 1878, a small caravan of six wagons left Kerrville, Texas. Martin Horn owned two of the wagons. He had seven children. Shug was the oldest at 13 years. Plus an adopted son, William Horn, and his wife, Zilpha, the sister of Martin Horn. They had seven children. They owned two wagons. Alonso Spencer and his wife Alice Hudson Spencer had two children. They owned one wagon. J.L. Nichols' brother-in-law of Martin owned the other wagon. About 50 people in all, including some free slaves. A man named Horn, who should describe as grim faced was the leader of the wagon train. He dashed about on his sorrow racer, giving no end of orders, trying to regulate the gait and habits of everyone. Horn was proud of his long list of exploits, but he had piloted many a wagon train into the new west. He said he knew Indian dialects and signs. If we ever had a leader, he was it. corral drill at every halt. The lead wagon, driven at a gallop, started to circle. Each following driver drawing his team alongside the left rear wheel of the wagon ahead. When the leader reached the last wagon, tongues were all inside the corral and canvas tops almost touched. The cattle that followed the wagon train had been gathered from the wild unbranded herds which roamed the range. They had been left attended by those that fought in the Civil War. There were hopes by the ambitious cowboys traveling with the expedition of selling the herd, which consisted of 500 head of cattle, not to mention 100 horses. En route, the cattle had stampeded when a storm produced loud thunder and lightning, which knocked a couple of uh, number of cattle off their feet late one night.
trample, but otherwise the cowboys had rounded up the herd by dawn. And two of the cowboys were brothers, Bill and Ed Hudson. Bill Hudson was 18 at the time, and his brother Ed was 13. Ed Hudson, born in April of 1862, whose Christian name was Edward Felix Lincoln Hudson. Shug was talking about how she and Grandpa met. I couldn't contain myself. I rustled in the feather bed and Shug had to stop her story until I settled down. Bell and Ed Hudson shared equally with the other cowboys herding doggies that belonged to the members of the wagon train. In return, they received their food on the journey. Another magnet that drew these two Hudson brothers into this perilous journey was that Bell was attached by the dark eyes of Maddie Holloman, sister of Mark Cohen. She was one of seven children. She was 11 years old when the wagon train left Kerrville. Ed, on the other hand, was attracted by Maddie's cousin, Shug Corn, eldest child of Martin Corn. Shug was only 10 years old. I couldn't help myself. That was only two years older than me. I wiggled back and forth in the bed until my grandmother had to shush me and threaten to not go on until I stopped moving around. My grandmother met my grandfather on the wagon train surrounded by cowboys and cattle. I was all ears. It took them three weeks to reach Horsehead Crossing on the Pecos River. They crossed the river and followed up the west bank until they reached the newly established village of Seven Rivers, New Mexico, some 60 miles south of the village of Roswell. The older men decided to leave the caravan and herd the livestock on a route towards Arizona to look for a location for settlement. While they were gone, Raiders stampeded the Remuda under the very noses of the night guard. It was several days before the remainder of the horses were rounded up. Then there was another crisis. Bell Hudson had gone looking for strays, and when he returned towards camp for dinner, driving a stray ahead of him, he felt something was wrong. Everyone was assembled outside the corral and seemed to be holding a conference. Suddenly, one of the train's members began firing his gun. One bullet took off Bell's hat, and other bullets whizzed by close to him. Bell shouted his name and kept advancing. Hey there! It's only Bell Hudson! Bell spurred his host, taking his rifle from the saddle case. They were cries of, look out, and traitor. He saw Ike Titus, a man who had joined the wagon train after they left. Bell raised his rifle, took aim, and shot his opponent over one eye with the bullet coming out of the back of his head. Shook said she saw the killing while she was grinding coffee. My God, what's going on, he asked the others. He was pale and shaken. He had never shot a man before. The squirrels, yes, but never a man. I thought he saw a chance to rob the train with the older man gone and turn traitor. <laughs> Looking in his saddlebag was most of the money of the outfit. I, Titus, had been a companion helping on the hardships of the trek, and now he was dead. When the older men returned, a kangaroo court was held. Those present when the affray occurred, should included, explained what had happened and championed Bell's actions. He was exonerated, but by the law of the trail, Mr. Holm, the wagon boss, was obliged to report the killing to the first representative of the law they might encounter. 
Three years later, Sheriff Pat Garrett would be commanded by the judge of the Third Judicial District Court to arrest Bell. An appearance bond was recorded. Bell showed up for the hearing and exonerated and allowed to go free. After the wagon train reached Roswell, the cowboys sold their cows and young stock to the new settlers. Most of the adventurers believed that they had reached the land of milk and honey on the north bank of the South Creek River. They set about selecting claims in an area that they called the Farms. The cowboys were advised to take the rest of their herd to Arizona, where the government paid good prices for beef. They moved up the Picos with a chuck wagon to fatten the steers on the abundant grass. The water on the Picos must have been terrible for it had to be dipped up, allowed to settle overnight, and strained through cloths. All drinking water had to be boiled and the water turned everything red. At the Picos camp, the Texas boys, Bale and Ed, made the most of the opportunity to rest from their arduous work for the past year. One evening, as they were eating a leisurely supper and watching the red waters of the Picos rise higher and higher, a rider appeared on the opposite bank and urged his mount into the flood. The powerful horse swam easily and he was soon in peace. Texas hospitality in the form of a plate of sourdough bread, beans, and beef with steaming hot coffee to wash it down was extended to the guest. I couldn't control myself. This was the part of the story I was waiting for. Louisa, are you all right? Contain yourself. You don't want to ruin the story for others. I didn't, but I did. It was all I could mumble as I burrowed deeper into the bed of bed. Grandmother continued after taking a sip of water. She described the visitor as rather small, but a handsome chap with keen blue eyes and a well-shaped head covered with nut-brown hair. His dress was the custom-made plainsman garb. He wore a wide sombrero, fine-heeled boots and two forty-fives buckled to his legs. The stranger's horse attracted Belle Hudson's attention at once. Belle owned some fine horses and took special pride in one which he thought the fastest in the West. Belle was always anxious to match him against the word of the opponent. Belle challenged the stranger to a horse race, his bay versus the stranger's black. The stranger had a fancy Mexican maid braided hair bridle with silver conchos. Belle owned a, a leather braided bridle he had spent many hours making. They raced for the bridle. The stranger said that he liked Belle's bridle and Belle liked his. And he thought it was a fair exchange for a little fun. They lined up at one end of a wide open space. And when the gun went off, Bell soon learned whose was the fastest. His pride tumbled to the dust. Black beat his bay. And the name of that horse was... Oh, go on and say it, Louise, before you explode. Black Bess, I started out. The horse's name was Black Bess. Okay, settle down. Let me get back to the story. Every day. The stranger came to camp. They chased the antelope and buffalo and had a little target practice as well. The cowboys were amazed at the stranger's aptitude for handling guns. The cowboys liked the visitor who stayed several days, but they had to admit they were no match for the young visitor in riding and shooting. His good looks and quick wit won Bell over. On the last day of the stranger's visit, he privately told Hudson he'd like for Hudson to come with him where he could show him how they could make a lot more money than following Longhorns. Bell had worked too hard, come too far to desert his friends now, so his answer was no. The stranger was gone as suddenly as he had come, and 
days later, they learned his identity from a mule tender of the U.S. mail, who told them their visitor had been none other than Billy the Kid. <laughs> Billy the Kid, I almost couldn't contain myself. <laughs> Bell, who was a member of Pat Garrett's posse that captured Billy, would have visited Billy often while he was in jail in Lincoln. Was it Bell who helped Billy escape on his horse black vest that returned days later covered in sweat? Oh, another family folklore story. But that story was for another time. It should have been to tell how Bell and Ed started the feedings with the herd and made about $1,500 from their sale. They then found work on the Nevada Ranch in Gila River Country, Arizona. They didn't return to Roswell for two years. Two years! The wait must have been tolerable. But when they did return, they took jobs with John S. Chisholm. They became great demands of parties. Bell played the fiddle, Ed sang, and called the dances. It was customary to dance all night in the moonlight until daybreak. The boys went home with the girls in the morning to breakfast with the girls' families. Bell and Ed claimed as their sweethearts, Maddie and Shug. And on December 28, 1882, in Roswell, Maddie, aged 14, married Bell, then 21. She went to work as a cook for Chisholm. And two years later, on December 23, Shug married Ed Hudson in Roswell. She was 16, he was 22. With that, the story ended. Shug was silent for a moment. And I know what she was thinking as the fire crackled and popped behind her. For the part of the story Shug didn't tell that night was that in the two years gap the brothers were gone, Shug's mother Mary died, and Shug had to assume household duties for her eight brothers and sisters. Shug's father married Julie McVickers, who was two years younger than my grandmother, and she had a hard time accepting her new and younger stepmother. She even wrote a poem about it.